and liftoff. Decollage, liftoff from a tropical rainforest to the edge of time itself. Launched in December 2021, NASA's newest space observatory is set to open a new chapter in astronomy. Thousands of people across 14 countries worked together to get this massive, complex spacecraft assembled and placed 1.5 million kilometers from Earth, where its tennis court-sized sunshield cools the telescope enough for its 18 gold-plated mirror segments to reflect the faint glow of heat emanating from objects throughout the universe. These infrared wavelengths will reveal chemical signatures in the atmospheres of exoplanets, stars forming behind clouds of gas and dust, and the earliest galaxies from shortly after the Big Bang. It's an awe-inspiring mission, but does its name invoke the same spirit of scientific exploration and shared humanity as the telescope itself? We are not waging a cold war. After the Hubble Space Telescope, named for astronomer Edwin Hubble, NASA continued to name most of its space telescopes after scientists. Typically, these missions would start with a technical name and then get renamed around the time it was launched. What I have heard as a rationale for that is like, in case of a launch failure, families of often didn't want to be associated with their just failed space telescope. So often they renamed the telescope after the successful commissioning of a telescope. Five months after the Gamma Ray Observatory launched in 1991, it was renamed after physicist Arthur Holly Compton. NASA renamed the X-ray Timing Explorer after astronomer Bruno Rossi three months after it launched in 1995. And in 1998, NASA announced a public contest to rename the Advanced X-ray Astrophysics Facility. The winning submission from a high school student was the Chandra X-ray Observatory, in honor of Indian-American Nobel laureate Subramanian Chandrasekhar. The Shuttle Infrared Telescope Facility was first renamed the Space Infrared Telescope Facility, and then after another public contest was renamed the Spitzer Space Telescope four months after it launched in 2003. In 2008, there was a contest to rename the Gamma Ray Large Area Space Telescope, which resulted in the observatory being renamed after physicist Enrico Fermi two months after launch. JWST took a different path. It was before construction even began that NASA announced the next generation space telescope would be renamed in honor of James E. Webb. Rather than going through any formal naming process, NASA Administrator Sean O'Keefe decided on the name himself in 2002. And in broad terms, our mandate is to pioneer the future, to push the envelope, to do what has never been done before. This took many in the astronomy community by surprise. Partners on the project apparently weren't consulted, and scientists wondered, who? One good person to ask who is science historian Audra Wolf, an expert on the role of science during the Cold War. So James Webb, who's usually referred to as Jim Webb, uh, is most famous for being the director of NASA during the Apollo years. He had previously been the Under Secretary of State under Truman. That's a second in command job at the State Department. He had also been director of the Bureau of the Budget. Uh, so he wasn't so much an engineer or a uh, any kind of space scientist, but a seasoned bureaucrat who knew a lot about uh, the workings of government. He is now bringing all of his remarkable skills of leadership and management to the service of our nation in this most urgent program in space. It is with particular pleasure that I present the Honorable James E. Webb. NASA says they're honoring James Webb not just for his leadership during Apollo, but also for pushing to have a balanced program with a focus on science. The whole thrust of the agency, in my opinion, is the lunar program. The rest of it is wasted in the people that are going to praise the brain work uh, have got some, some doubts about it, and they're not going to tell this point. As to whether the actual landing on the moon is what you call the highest priority. Uh, they, think the highest priority. they think the highest priority is to understand the environment and, and the areas uh, of the laws of nature that operate out there as they apply backwards into space. You can say it this way. With Webb championing science at the agency, NASA launched more than 75 space science missions by the end of the 1960s. 
But if we are honoring Webb's leadership, it's worth taking a broader look at all the things that happened in government while Webb was in charge. So at the State Department, Jim Webb really pioneered the idea that you could use science um, as a tool for foreign relations. And then separately, he also uh, requested the study and implemented the findings of something called Project Troy, which really set the groundwork for the United States psychological warfare programs throughout the Cold War, with a really broad definition of psychological warfare as basically anything short of live bullets or economic warfare. As a weapon of war, psychological warfare is no novelty. It is as old as war itself. But the use of this force as an integral part of combat has now taken on new forms. And science was a part of that. The, the group had originally been formed to think about how to um, unjam Voice of America broadcasts because the Soviet Union had been jamming their radio broadcasts. But this group really took a much broader uh, interpretation of that mission, thinking about everything from how the United States could exploit uh, Stalin's death to um, how you could use battles for prestige, say scientific prestige, uh, to win hearts and minds around the world. The space race and the Apollo program, of course, were also a big part of the Cold War. The thing to understand about how Jim Webb saw the Apollo project is that on the one hand, yes, this was a scientific project. It was a technological spectacle. For Jim Webb, the point of the Apollo program was always to demonstrate the benefits of the so-called American way of life to the rest of the world, that the Apollo program was part of the Cold War contest to win the allegiance, uh, particularly of leaders in newly independent countries, to convince them that the way that, they, that, that, the way that leaders did things in the United States and that the way that the government worked in the United States was preferable to that in the Soviet Union. The Cold War was closely interwoven into many of the activities Webb was involved in at the State Department and NASA. Another major aspect of that was the systematic purging of suspected gay employees, known today as the Lavender Scare. Two Republican congressmen claim Russia keeps a list of homosexuals in U.S. government jobs. Four State Department employees resigned last year while under Senator investigation. Senator McCarthy testified today that a homosexual had been hired by the Central Intelligence Agency after the State Department Since allowed him to resign. The Department has considered homosexuals and other sexes to be a security risk. It is the consequence of the deed that laid the individual open to blackmail. He is ashamed. He is right to stick on his mouth to life and get fired. Four State Department employees in Korea have resigned after being accused of homosexual activities. The State Department spokesman said the whole group has been resigned. The law has notified them and have been investigated for sexual harassment. The Lavender Scare was closely tied to the Red Scare a frenzy drummed up by Senator Joseph McCarthy and others that communists were hiding in the U.S. government. In February 1950, McCarthy claimed that over 200 communists were working for the State Department. Even if there are only one communist in the State Department, that would still be one communist too many. During Webb's February 13th staff meeting, they discussed vigorously defending the quality of the department's security against McCarthy's accusations. And in an effort to do so, Later that day, Deputy Undersecretary John Purifoy told the Congressional Committee that the State Department had already been actively working to remove security threats from their employment roster. None of them were communists, but of the 202 people they had fired over the previous two years, 91 were suspected to be homosexuals. As stated in historian David Johnson's book on the Lavender Scare, rather than see the revelation as evidence of an effective security system, Many interpreted it as proof that the State Department, perhaps the entire government, was infiltrated with sexual perverts. Senator Clyde Huey was tasked with investigating the situation. Huey told his chief counsel, I don't want any public hearings at all on this matter. I want it as low key as possible. Do it thoroughly, investigate it from hell to breakfast, but we're not going to have any hearings that McCarthy can make big headlines out of. Senator Huey asked Jim Webb how his committee could work together with the executive branch on the investigation. On June 22, during one of Webb's regular meetings with President Truman, they discussed Senator Huey's request. I informed the president that Senator Huey had wished me to find out how his committee and the executive branch could work together on the homosexual investigation, and he advised me to say to the senator that he was sure we could find a proper basis for cooperation. 
He approved a suggestion that Mr. Murphy, Mr. Spingarn, and I see Senator Huey on Saturday to discuss the necessary problems involving this cooperation. James E. Webb. To prepare for the meeting with Senator Huey, the Assistant Secretary of State for Administration, Carlisle Humelzine, sent James Webb a package of information on June 24th. This included suggestions on how the Senate committee should conduct its investigation and how the State Department should work with them, as well as a background paper on the problem of homosexuals and sex perverts in the Department of State. This was quite literally a state-sponsored manifesto of homophobia, describing homosexuals as emotionally unstable and abhorrent and repugnant to the mores of American society. But it also gives a lot of background information. As the document mentions, the government had no rules against the employment of homosexuals, and it wasn't until just recently that anyone really considered it a problem. In 1947, Humelstein's predecessor, John Purifoy, took it upon himself to start ordering really intrusive investigations into the State Department's employees to seek out possible homosexuals. By 1950, there were two full-time security staff members devoted to these investigations, which involved inquiries at all places of employment, all residences and habitats. They tried to determine if any friends or associates were homosexual, and placed employees under surveillance to determine if they were visiting any known homosexual places. Suspected employees were interrogated by the investigator and the chief of the Division of Departmental Personnel or Foreign Service Personnel. If they came to the conclusion that the employee was homosexual, they were promptly fired. And again, at the time, there was no actual rule against homosexuals being employed in the government. Humulsin's stated argument for firing them, in addition to thinking they were repugnant, was that... Most homosexuals are weak, unstable, and fickle people who fear detection and who are therefore susceptible to the wanton designs of others. So the State Department considered homosexuals a security risk. And according to Executive Order 9835, signed by President Truman in 1947, agencies were responsible for ensuring that disloyal employees were not retained. In the very next paragraph, though, Humulsin admits that... We have no evidence, however, that these designs of others have caused a breach of security of the department. In fact, throughout the Lavender Scare, no one ever had evidence of a U.S. government employee being blackmailed into giving a foreign power state secrets due to their sexual orientation. But that did not stop the State Department from devoting considerable resources to subjecting its employees to surveillance of the most personal aspects of their lives. Equipped with this information, Jim Webb met with Senator Huey on June 28th, along with Stephen Spingarn and Charles Murphy, two of President Truman's advisors. According to Spingarn's account of the meeting, Webb gave the senator that paper Humelstein wrote, the manifesto of the State Department's homophobic viewpoints and justifications for firing homosexual employees. They discussed whether any part of the Senate hearing should be public. Huey and Spingarn said they thought maybe the medical testimony should be public and the rest in executive session, but Jim Webb wasn't sure, and they all agreed they would think about it some more. As far as we know from easily accessible information, that was the extent of Webb's direct involvement with the Senate hearings. According to the suggested process written up by Carlisle Humelstein, Humelstein himself would serve as the department's spokesperson on the Senate investigation, while Webb and Secretary Dean Acheson would be kept informed of all significant developments and should be available for behind-the-scenes activities when necessary. With a generally homophobic society, most members of the public and Congress were all too ready to believe the sorts of positions touted in Humelstein's memo to Jim Webb. The majority of other government agencies also agreed, but not all of them. For example, the acting director of the Federal Mediation and Conciliation Service told the committee, Since it is possible, according to our understanding of medical and psychiatric opinion on the subject, for a homosexual to lead a normal, well-adjusted life, we do not consider that such a person necessarily constitutes a bad security risk. After the Senate subcommittee's investigation, their report stated that homosexuals should be fired for two reasons. First, they are generally unsuitable, and second, they constitute security risks. The State Department's actions and the Senate subcommittee's report caused the practice of tracking down and firing suspected homosexual employees to spread widely across the federal government and initiated decades of homophobic policies. President Eisenhower signed Executive Order 10450 in 1953, which explicitly added sexual perversion as a reason for an individual being unsuitable for government employment. 
By the time Jim Webb became NASA Administrator in 1961, some of the media and congressional attention to the Lavender Scare had died down, but many agencies were still regularly targeting queer employees. On October 22, 1963, NASA budget analyst Clifford Norton was driving his car near Lafayette Square. Two police officers from the Moral Squad saw Norton pick up a man, drive around the block, and drop him off in the same spot, at which point the man drove off in a separate car. The officers followed both men to Norton's apartment building, where they arrested the two of them in the parking lot and took them to the Moral's office to issue a traffic violation for speeding. The police interrogated both men for two hours about their activities and sexual histories. Meanwhile, the head of the Moral Squad called over the NASA security chief, who arrived at 3 a.m. and watched the last part of the police interrogation as Norton continued to deny the homosexual accusations. Then the security chief brought Clifford Norton over to NASA headquarters, where he and a colleague interrogated Norton until 6 a.m. Through these hours of late night interrogation, Norton conceded that he sometimes experienced homosexual desires when drinking, but continued to deny he was a homosexual. After the interrogations, Clifford Norton's supervisor said he believed Norton was a competent employee doing very good work, and he asked personnel officers whether there was any way to avoid firing Norton, because he didn't think this was a real security problem to worry about. The personnel officers told the supervisor that it was custom within the agency to fire anyone involved in homosexual conduct. So, Norton was fired due to possessing traits of character and personality that render him unsuitable for further government employment. Custom within the agency implies that NASA fired others as well. There isn't any easily accessible information on how many suspected homosexual people NASA interrogated and fired during Jim Webb's administration. The only reason we know about Clifford Norton is because he fought back. Norton called up Frank Kameny, who at that point was known for advocating for government employees who were dismissed over their sexuality. In fact, Frank Kameny was an astronomer who the American Astronomical Society has celebrated for his leadership in the gay rights movement. He got started because he was trained at Harvard by Cecilia Payne Kapushkin uh, to be an astronomer. He went and he worked for the U.S. Army um, uh, with his astronomy degree and he was fired. And he was so outraged by that that he turned it into a lifelong pursuit of activism of, of getting these laws changed. This was at a time when people in my profession were in higher demand than they had been in all of human history. And I could not get a job specifically because of homosexuality. And I am not alone. I know many people who have done the same. I've seen careers ruined, uh, lives destroyed for no other reason. These were people with a great deal to offer to society, simply because society uh, is prejudiced against them and will not allow them equality of opportunity. He coined the term, K is good. And therefore said, like, if it's good, and if it's an inherited good thing for us to be out, then it cannot be a security risk, because that was always the argument. Frank Kameny helped gather facts on the case and referred Clifford Norton to an attorney with the ACLU. After a prolonged legal battle, the U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals ruled in 1969 that federal employees could not be fired solely on the grounds of being homosexual. Homosexuality would justify dismissal only if it demonstrably affected the employee's performance on the job. NASA's Clifford Norton case and efforts from activists like astronomer Frank Kameny slowly turned the tide on institutional homophobia. But government discrimination against queer people continued for years. Should someone be able to serve their country if they say they are homosexuals? The State Department in 2017 made a partial public apology for the Lavender Scare, but NASA and other agencies have never apologized for their participation. And as far as we know, no effort was ever made to compensate the victims or their family members. In 2002, when Administrator Sean O'Keefe renamed the Next Generation Space Telescope after James Webb, a lot of this information was not widely known. And though astronomers were confused by the unilateral decision to name the telescope after a former administrator, many were just happy the project had high-level support and funding. But in the mid-2010s, a few started to raise questions about what Webb's role was during the Lavender Scare. 
So I think it must have been around 2015 or so when I was still on the executive committee for C Sigma. That's the committee on the status of sexual orientation and gender minorities in astronomy. I was a founding member of the, the committee and a blog entry came our way that raised questions about James Webb's participation in the Lavender Scare. And there was some discussion about, you know, how we as a committee should respond to that. And then essentially the attitude from particularly from the more senior members was the, the ship has sailed on that and there wasn't really anything that we can do about it. And at that point, I kind of dropped it as a thing that I could change, but decided it was something that I could at least talk openly about. In early 2021, four astronomers launched a petition to change the name of the telescope. And Chanda Prescott-Weinstein, Sarah Tuttle, Brian Nord, and myself decided that prior to the telescope's launch, we would create a petition that would essentially allow the astronomical community to coalesce around having this change of name. Hence the start of the petition and an attempt to kind of bring this to more, more astronomers and just say, hey, is this a thing we want to touch base about before this telescope gets launched and we start collecting data with it? You know, let's, let's sort of check in uh, and see what's going on here. It was really heartening to see that over 1,800 people signed the petition. These are folks from as early a career as in high school to, to major senior PIs, people inside and outside academia, including 10% uh, of the signatories are people who have applied for JWST time. So people who are getting ready to use the instrument, people who are excited for the science are, are included in those people who, who signed the petition. Meanwhile, internally, NASA started an informal investigation into James Webb's role in the Lavender Scare, led by the JWST program scientist and the NASA historian. They were having trouble accessing records because the National Archives and the Truman Library were closed to researchers due to COVID. But after a few months, they got a contract set up for an independent historian to do research once the archives opened up. In the meantime, the independent historian started reading through some more readily accessible materials and came across the Clifford Norton case. The historian noted that a custom within the agency sounds pretty bad, and NASA under the direction of Webb was able to set its own rules for whom should be removed and for what reasons. Members of both the Astrophysics Advisory Committee and the American Astronomical Society's Committee for Sexual Orientation and Gender Minorities asked NASA for updates on the investigation and information on NASA's process for reconsidering the name. For the most part, NASA leadership gave those committees the same information that they were giving to reporters and the public. NASA was aware of the concerns, and they were working with historians to examine Webb's role in government. Over the summer, one of the interns in the history department also started looking into information on James Webb, and in early September wrote a lengthy email full of information and sources. They wrote, That Webb played a leadership position in the Lavender Scare is undeniable. The only thing left up to historical debate in this matter is whether or not his heart was in it. Was Webb emotionally invested in the persecution of LGBTQ people? Either way, one thing is clear, he still did those things. And those things served a key role in a bigger thing, a thing that, as NARA archivist Judith Atkins has pointed out, led many to suicide. The NASA historian said that there was a lot of good information in the intern's write-up that he would include in his final report. Meanwhile, the independent historian still had not been able to access the archives, which were set to open in October. But on September 27th, a one-sentence statement from NASA Administrator Bill Nelson was sent to six reporters. We have found no evidence at this time that warrants changing the name of the James Webb Space Telescope. There is no report released and no details on the investigation. And a lot of people were upset about NASA's lack of transparency. I subsequently quit the committee. <laughs> Um, receiving that news, which was um, not only extremely disappointing, but also uh, seemed to be something of a slap in the face because of its dismissive nature, because I have no intention of offering my time and consulting services to NASA if NASA is not going to take the APAC seriously. A representative from the American Astronomical Society Committee was able to later meet with a NASA historian. Um, he was very frank, very open about the whole thing, about the limitations of his work and what it means, what we can and can't say about James Webb, the person. And uh, I was very pleased with what I saw as the work he was doing and the perspective he was bringing to it. That said, 
I think it's important that NASA look at this differently than it has been. I think it's asking the wrong questions. The Committee for Sexual Orientation and Gender Minorities in Astronomy relayed their concerns to the Board of the American Astronomical Society, and in November, the President wrote a letter to Administrator Nelson asking for NASA to finish the investigation and release a formal report. She also expressed misgivings that the primary user group for the telescope had no say in its name. On the initiative of our committee, the uh, WS as a whole asked uh, NASA to be transparent about the process and to come up with a transparent process of naming space telescope, period. Administrator Nelson never responded, so in March, the Astronomical Society president wrote a second letter describing the lack of response and dismissal of concerns as troubling. I was pleased to see that the Board of Trustees at the American Astronomical Society was proactive about this. One of the things the American Astronomical Society asked him to do was to articulate some kind of standard for what a good name for the telescope would be so that we understand what the investigation is trying to turn up. The primary concern is that the name of the telescope matters and is important, and it should be very well chosen and have broad resonance. The question NASA seems interested in asking its historians goes to whether James Webb was personally a bigot, which is a different question, I think. Looking for concrete proof one way or another on Webb's personal viewpoints on queer employees is perhaps a fruitless task. Anybody who's done historical research during this time period can tell you that's not how these documents work in the first place. Uh, you are unlikely to find specific documents where individual people, specifically senior leaders, say, yes, let's do X bad thing. Um, kind of as a policy, that is not how the State Department um, documents work from that time period. I think that we can do better than naming a scientific instrument that has the possibility to answer questions that the entire world is interested in uh, after a cold warrior who, you know, basically set up the United States uh, psychological warfare programs, particularly for science. I think we can I think we can do better than that, particularly for an international uh, collaborative scientific project. NASA has in the last 20 years developed a strong history of having open calls for what it should be uh, named after and to really have pick figures that are significant and can show us where we want to go in the future. So Journal of Truth as uh, the name one of the Mars rovers, the Nancy Roman Space Telescope. It's great, great picks. Uh, the JWST name, unfortunately, is not one of them. This seemed easy. It seemed like it should be easy. Uh, it seemed like we should be able to have this conversation. There's information in the archives. We should be able to come together as a community and, and just figure it out, right? Figure out what our values are and how we want those to be expressed. So I think that at some level, at every turn of this, it feels like NASA has made it much harder for themselves than it needs to be. I think NASA has been making it harder on everyone by not being willing to start or even participate in having a sort of a transparent and open conversation about the issue at hand with this particular name for this particular telescope and the idea of how we name telescopes or other instruments in general. We have a difficulty, I think, in the scientific community, and I think this is an example presented here, in having these difficult conversations about topics like this. So I, I think that every, every moment from now on is an opportunity for us to start having those conversations, and I really, really hope that NASA is willing to engage in that. During a town hall meeting in April 2022, Astrophysics Division Director Paul Hertz noted that the investigation was still ongoing. NASA is aware that some of the community is hurt and, much, and more of the community is disappointed in NASA's response. Uh, when we complete our research, uh, we will uh, release that additional information. Uh, and at that time, we'll look for the community to reassess whether or not we have reestablished that trust. There are many reasons why James Webb isn't a great pick for the telescope name. The name was a unilateral decision that didn't go through the naming process required by NASA's own policies. The astronomy community and partners on the project were not consulted and had no say in the name. Naming the telescope for a Cold War bureaucrat seems like a questionable choice for an international scientific collaboration. And of course, James Webb's connection to the Lavender Scare is painful to many astronomers in the queer community. LGBTQIA plus people today are still feeling the effects of a society that was not built for them to be included. 
A recent 2021 study showed that LGBTQ professionals in STEM overall have fewer career opportunities than their colleagues, experience more harassment and health difficulties, and are more likely to consider leaving the field. Individually, though, experiences in astronomy vary widely across different sexual and romantic orientations, gender identities and expression, races and ethnicities, nationalities, disabilities, and other personal attributes. I knew that I would be able to at some point come out in the South African community because the first gay person that I knew as a scientist who was out was a senior astronomer in South Africa and they were openly gay and I think that had a very profound effect on me. It, it took many years for me to get to that point but seeing someone you know who has succeeded in their career be openly gay was subconsciously a very powerful message for me to see and I really appreciated that. What I've noticed the most is lack of visibility. I remember being to conferences and feeling like I was the only non cisgender heterosexual person there. And it can be really alienating because either people are talking about work stuff, which is fine, or they're talking about their family lives, which is very, very heteronormative. Obviously, most people assume you're heterosexual. So when I mention my partner, usually people then will usually assume that my partner would be using a pronoun she, her, right? And so they would usually ask, what does she do? Or something like that. And this kind of just general assumption, it's not a big deal, but it adds up. Like then you kind of need to deal with like, should I coming out at this moment? Do I want to correct them for using a wrong pronoun? Do I not to worry about that? And like, what should I do? So a lot of uh, a lot of non-binary people use they, them pronouns or they use neo pronouns like these or them. And it can be very, very difficult to get your peers on board with the way to properly address you. And it really shouldn't be, uh, but especially more senior folks will be resistant to use they, them, or zizer. Another one is bathroom usage. The group of trans astronomers, the group of non-binary astronomers uh, heavily intersect. And so a big issue for non-binary folks especially is, is there a gender neutral bathroom around that I can use? And often in, you know, in physics departments, in astronomy departments, there isn't. I am a lesbian and the jokes about lesbians in physics that we were either ugly or of course we, we were not considered women because we were not useful for, for men. I shared those all my career. I was open about my that, that I was a lesbian very late in my life. Uh, so most of the time I didn't feel safe to say anything about it. It, it was just like so, something that the community itself didn't seem to embrace. There's a lot of good allies, but it's really hard to spot who they are when no one engages in the conversation. And this is, for, from my personal experience, being a sexual, because sexuality is something that is very, very erased. This is a part that resonates with me. But the queer community is incredibly complex and very rich. When I started as, a, as an assistant professor, you know, there were a couple other assistant professors roughly at the same time. And, you know, we were all like either single or in, you know, relatively early on in relationships. But then over time, faculty members, you know, started having families. You know, I was in a relationship, but I, I didn't have a family and wasn't really interested in having one. Um, and so my kind of life and lifestyle diverged a lot. It's kind of this, it's kind of this implicit heteronormative structure that's actually built into the way the, the reward system and the the structure of the department as well and that can be somewhat difficult to navigate. So I came out as non-binary last year in 2021. There, there was a time at one of my jobs where my boss, he was purposely like misgendering me. I guess I didn't know how to navigate because multiple people like had to like corrected him. It just really kind of felt like an attack on me as a person. Like if, if my boss can't even like support who I am, just knowing that like there's so many more people like that really kind of makes it hard navigating through life. Documentation exists on how to create a more welcoming environment in astronomy. Some tangible actions include providing better health care, more access to bathrooms, and easy ways to share pronouns as well as well-enforced policies against discrimination and harassment. We love to understand the universe. And in order to do this in an ethical way, we have to respect the people that we work with. We need buy-in from the top levels, from the people who are actually at the levers of power to change things, um, change the policy. 
Many astronomers feel that changing the name of the telescope would be a way for NASA to start to reckon with its past and help reinforce the values NASA wants to carry into the future. I think it would help send the message that NASA in its current era does not tolerate the same sort of intolerance that was present in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. We are going to do our best to foster an inclusive, accepting, and welcoming environment that we want people who have been historically discriminated against and persecuted because they make our agency strong. And for, for astronomers who are using the telescope, applying for time, you know, writing up their work, knowing that they're kind of reinvigorating the legacy of somebody who very clearly did not support them. I think it's a particularly heavy burden to ask queer astronomers um, to have to carry that burden. It kind of sends a pretty clear message about who is considered important or relevant. You know, this isn't James Webb on trial. This is what should we name the telescope? And I don't think anyone starting from a clean sheet looking at lists of names and coming up with the best name would have James Webb uh, anywhere near the top of that list. You know, I realize that people's legacies are often complicated, but, you know, having a telescope named after you is not something that everybody just gets. Uh, to be honest, I'm not quite sure why in this particular case NASA is so insistent uh, on James Webb. It, it feels a little bit strange. There are just so many choices for name, right? Even if James Webb was a great guy, if this name is not, it doesn't get buy-in from the community, I don't see a strong reason that we need to stick to this specific net. One suggestion for a different name for the observatory could be the Harriet Tubman Space Telescope. So I think that when we're talking about sending something that represents humanity into space, that we should be thinking about sending the best of humanity into space and something that represents our very best. And Harriet Tubman is an exemplar of who we can be as a species and as individuals in terms of um, a, a commitment to what is right and doing what is right, a commitment to justice and a commitment to being um, actively engaged in struggle and um, to liberation. The criticisms that I have sometimes heard are, you know, like, oh, well, Harriet Tubman wasn't an astronomer. Well, neither was James Webb. And also, um, you know, I think the question of who is an astronomer, right? Like, let's think about why wasn't Harriet Tubman an astronomer, even though she observed the night sky and used the stars for celestial navigation in the service of something that could not have been greater, right? People's freedom. Um, you know, to me, like, that makes her an astronomer. With, with the name, I just see a lot more hope and happiness. There's a lot, a lot more positive characteristics that come with a name such as Harriet Tubman Space Telescope than comes with James Webb, I'd say. And it gives a lot of people who have traditionally been excluded in the community a lot of a sense of belonging, I'd say. There's no doubt that James Webb was a talented NASA administrator who advocated for the inclusion of science programs. But would Webb himself have wanted this telescope to be named after him when so many people were objecting? It does seem quite clear that the uh, decision makers, that, that when there were critiques of the name, that NASA administrators' response was primarily to shut that down and rationalize their decisions and to say, you know what, this is inconvenient and we think the people who are making these claims are not in the mainstream and we're just going to ignore it. Webb himself, the man who they are supposedly trying to honor, has at length made the opposite argument, saying that descent is integral and that public opinion changes and that executives have an obligation to think through that, to have an open discussion, to acknowledge their own mistakes. Um, but that is the only way that you can maintain the public's trust. It is entirely possible that an endeavor that has been strongly and enthusiastically endorsed on all sides at its inception might suddenly find itself in support trouble. Dissent is an integral part of our system. We do not have, and for my part, emphatically do not want, Soviet-type arrangements whereby once a decision is made by the authorities to do something, the decision automatically becomes binding on everybody, and no one has either the right or the opportunity to object or oppose. Webb's defenders say he cannot possibly be held responsible for the lavender scare at the State Department. And you can't have it both ways. Either Webb is an administrative genius who understands how these organizations work from top to bottom, or he's not. 
Um, and, and the thing is that as a theorist of organizations, he has written about this himself in space age management. And he is on the side that senior administrators and executives are in fact responsible for those decisions. We can change its name. We can move past this controversy and we can find other ways to honor the people who worked at NASA during the Apollo period to, uh, to honor the people who never had the chance to work at NASA and to kind of honor people who have thought about the possibilities of the universe for generations who would never have found positions in the State Department or in NASA during this time period. And we have a real opportunity to think about what it really means to think of science as an international collaborative inspiring enterprise and naming a telescope after a cold warrior is not the way to do that. Hi, I'm Lucianne Walkowicz, they, them. And I'm Erica Nesbold, she, her. And we are the co-founders of the Just Space Alliance. Thank you so much for watching this video on James Webb's role in the Cold War and the Lavender Scare. There's a link in the description to a folder with a bunch of resources and the documents that were used in the making of this video. And if you're interested in signing the petition to rename the telescope, you can also find that link in the video description. You can also express your support by tweeting about this documentary, tagging NASA, and using the hashtag RenameJWST. We founded the Just Space Alliance to advocate for a more inclusive and ethical future in space. And to harness visions of tomorrow for a more just and equitable world today. If you're interested in supporting that mission, you can become a member of the Just Space Alliance by applying on our website, justspacealliance.org. You can also sign up for our free quarterly newsletter on the website or follow us on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram. Thanks for watching.